we will incorporate the remaining questions uh, as best Michael's able to do in the panel uh, on space-based solar power, <clears throat> excuse me, engineering the future. <clears throat> we'll have four of our prior speakers, Michael Lane, who will moderate the panel, Jim Vetta, Pete Gerritsen, and John Mankins. And now it, it appears that we have Colonel Felt back on the line and uh, he's up for, for a good discussion as well. So Michael, please take it away. Hey all, um, I don't see, Pete, are you still here? I am. Okay, good, okay, cool. Uh, folks, I really appreciate, uh, you know, this has been kind of the culmination of, of two days where we've talked about some of the history, you know, a lot of level setting about where we, where we are currently and, you know, where I live, I tend to spend a lot of time in the future. So, um, one of the things I want to talk to y'all about is, is kind of immediate next steps. Uh, you know, each of you have your own path, your own uh, project, you're approaching this problem from your own perspective. Uh, if I were to ask, you know, what does the next 18 months look like? Um, what, what, would, what would that look like? And uh, I, I don't have a, I don't care which order, so just anybody rattle off what, what, you're, what you've got. Uh, this is Jim. Uh, I, I think that uh, what what I expressed when I was uh, giving the rundown of our recent paper uh, is, is what I would use to answer this uh, question, and, and that is to have the U.S. administration put forth a strategy for demonstration of an end-to-end -end system. And it doesn't have to be you know, high power. It's just the minimal power levels to show that everything works from the collection to the transmission to the reception to plugging it into some uh, useful application. And uh, doing that on a small scale and showing that it works with space-based components uh, is something that, uh, that we can prove and then say, all right, now how do we scale it up? So I, I would like to see a, a commitment uh, of, uh, of US government support for a long range project to demonstrate end-to-end -end systems uh, with the intention of then uh, moving forward uh, with, with scaling up. Dr. Veda, does that, is that different than the work that Colonel Felt is working on? Is that bigger, different? Well, I, I, I see, it as, I see it as bigger. I see it as bigger because, uh, there, uh, you know, AFRL is doing some great work. Uh, the uh, Na Naval Research Lab is doing some great work. They're working on some components, some pr proof of concept. Uh, they are not, as, as was being discussed when, when the subject of funding came up earlier, they are not being given the funding or the long-term mandate to do a uh, complete system. And, and I think that's, that's what's, what's needed. What they're doing eventually could lead to what we want, but with a stimulus behind it, and I'm thinking of something akin to the way we saw the uh, uh, NASA and DOD development of communication satellites in the early 1960s uh, when uh, both agencies saw, the, saw it for their own benefit. Uh, the US government saw it as a benefit. It was something that was envisioned as a, uh, uh, a likely uh, economic success. And it was also envisioned as something that would be uh, a foreign policy tool to win hearts and minds around the world. So there was a lot of push behind it that, um, that included not just here's some money to do research on components, but actually to let's get a complete system out there operating that people can use as quickly as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that impetus is what is, is needed right now. And I'm, I'm glad to see all the stuff that's, that's going on uh, at this point, but it's just a first step. I think we really need to, to, uh, to have it pushed to a long-term strategy. Uh, gentlemen, uh, sir, hang on just one second. I want to draw one more piece, a little, a, a moment deeper. Uh, Dr. Vetter, in your opening statement, when you first presented, you said that your, you know, the aerospace leadership specifically called out this part of the study um, and, and said, let's do this study. I'm curious what that looked like. Was there uh, uh, 
you know, when you were doing the study originally, what kind of reactions were you getting to do the study? Oh, from, from my company's leadership? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, were, it's known as a very conservative organization, so that it is asking about an unusual project like this, kind of a, an audacious project like this. Well, I, I yeah. think a lot, a lot of people who may know the history of aerospace cooperation may be surprised at, at how things are evolving there and, I'm be, surprised. and be more forward looking and more supportive of, of commercial activity. That's, that's not what you might uh, predict from knowing their long term history going all the way back to 1960. Uh, but that is what is happening uh, at uh, at aerospace corporation now, and there are uh, there are many people who see the strong future of commercial as as a big benefit for the national interest. Um, uh, we we always talk about at, at the company that we we want to do what is in the nation's best interest, not just what's in the air force or the space force best interest. You know, it's looking bigger than that. And what is in that best interest includes. The, the development of civil and commercial uh, activities um, and, uh, and, and innovative concepts like space solar power. So uh, I, I did not find it that surprising that there are, were enthusiasts around the company. Uh, it was, uh, I, I enjoyed hearing handed down to me through my management chain, uh, the, the request that, hey, you got to cover this topic in your, uh, uh, Space Agenda 2021 project, uh, of which I was the overall editor. Um, so that's why it came to me. So I said, I'd be happy to write that for myself. That's uh, one of my favorite topics. Right. And so that's, that's why it's in there. Terrific. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, Colonel Felt, you had a, a comment. Are you going to go back to the 18-month question or are you responding to... Uh, I, I'd like to respond to the 18-month question. I think number one, we need to continue executing the projects that are underway because while they're small scale, they're vital technology enablers. And I don't see any, any problem with that. But number two, I really think we need some kind of national strategy and vision laid out there because this crop this should cross across multiple departments of our US government and fully engage and energize the private sector. So I really like to see you know, a, a, a whole of government and a whole of nation strategy and priority laid out about how important this is to our space industrial base and our future as a nation. And then it would task out Department of Energy, you do this, you know, Department of Defense, you do this. That that strategy is the second thing. And then that would then then presumably some resources would flow with that. But you know, in terms of resources flowing, what I'd really like to see the government do is be an enabler of, of private sector entrepreneurial activity. And you know, it, you put a little seed corn out there, but then you let the the Elon Musks and the, and the Amazons and all the entrepreneurs go out there and actually build the, the next generation of bigger systems to get the end to end demo done as soon as we want. But I, I, I don't, I, I think we could do those three things. This is, this would be on a good track. Terrific. Uh, you know, I know that you were pretty instrumental in that industrial base uh, event that happened last year. Do you want to talk for a moment about uh, the North star uh, whole of government approach? Uh, you want to talk about that event? Because I think that was a pretty, I think that was a pretty big deal. It, it was. We had a great event last year. That was one of the number one, I think that was the number one recommendation that came out. Give some background because most people don't know what we're talking about. Okay, so uh, last year uh, after, this was kind of after COVID broke out and and we were concerned about the state of the health of the industrial base, not just in space, but across the, the whole nation. AFRL got together with DIU and the Space Force, and we decided, you know, well, let's talk about what we need to be doing to enable our U.S. commercial space companies to remain viable in the presence of the of the uh, pandemic, and uh, you know, beat China so that we don't get another strategic surprise like them taking over the, the drone industry. So that, that was the motivation behind it. We had the event, ended up not being super focused on COVID because we were like, I think we'll get through COVID, but we have some really big strategic challenges to address. And it got, and, and we had, uh, the key breakthroughs were really, I think that it was not just technology focused, but it was like, okay, how do we bring the finance enablers in? How do we set up the right incentive structure? So we don't want big government programs. We want the government to be an informed and, uh, and deliberate 
buyer and then let, let everybody come in and entrepreneur, be, be the entrepreneurs that we're so good at. So uh, we talked to, uh, there were a lot of good strategic thoughts there. We put out a report and I, I would summarize this, the state of the space industrial base last year as, you know, uh, healthy uh, for now, but, but fragile long-term because we kind of lacked some, some guiding lights, if you will. Space solar power should be one of those guiding lights. And I think uh, that we talked about a lot of different things at that conference, but the number one recommendation was, hey, we need a, a, a government to set sort of a North Star approach so that the various agencies can get on board and enable commercial activity. So that was the, the number one recommendation that it's still needed. And I think this should be one of those, uh, one of those guiding lights that comes out of it. We're having another this year's 2021 version of the state of the space industrial base in July. Uh, you know, uh, it'll be July 12th through 15th, if I remember the dates right. And, uh, uh, you know, welcome wide participation. The key to success last year was that it wasn't just, you know, NASA and the DOD getting together to chat about space. Uh, we had all kind, we had lots of industry people there, finance people there. Uh, all of that was the key to success. And we've got another one coming up this July. I think the, this July, it's going to, the, the focus it will be not on COVID, but it will be on, again, how do we enable US industry to best compete with China and remain the leaders in space? And I expect our number one recommendation, if I had to guess, would be the same as last year, is that we still need this North Star guiding light. But I think the key here is if with the concern about climate change and energy intersecting with the space opportunities, uh, that's where I see this as a really good, uh, you know, one of the North Star guiding visions that we could and should have. Terrific. Uh, it was great being there last year. I look forward to the next one. I, a lot of important stuff came out of that meeting. So hats off to y'all for coordinating that. Sticking to the 18 months uh, uh, time frame, uh, uh, Colonel Garrison, you want to you wanna chat about what your ideas are? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think in, in 18 months, it is uh, not a stretch at all. You know, first of all, to hope that the funding for the two existing programs continues and I hope expands as we pass the new NDAA. Um, but, uh, you know, but on the policy side, now that we have, you know, re, you know, restarting the National Space Council, they should get uh, briefings on space solar power and that should be directed towards focusing a policy. As I said, in the next 18 months for sure, uh, the, the White House could issue two space policy directives, one an executive order on space solar power for the first time, an actual national policy and guiding you know, vision, uh, saying that we want to do something in this area and then who would take what steps. And then uh, you know, a, another one that would focus the long-term efforts of what we're trying to build on the moon towards an industrial base that could produce solar power satellites. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, presidential findings that these component aspects of our industrial base uh, ought to, you know, be findings under Defense Production Act Title III, which allows for advanced purchase orders, uh, lower financing, and uh, uh, and uh, other incentives that uh, that make it easier to scale up industry deliberately. Um, and, you know, I just want to applaud, you know, John Mankins, who's sort of carried this idea through the desert, applaud AFRL, who's carrying water now. Uh, I also want to applaud, um, you know, what aerospace has done with Agenda 2021 to try to build a whole of nation policy strategy and the Atlantic Council that has you know, provided their input as to what a North Star vision uh, could look like. And I do agree uh, with uh, Colonel felt that we absolutely need an overall national North Star vision. And let me just point out that the last administration took a great step forward with their uh, a new vision of deep sp space exploration and development for, for, for the first time they discussed development and, uh, and settlement. But clearly what is missing from that policy are any kind of industrial targets for the moon and its development. Uh, as well as any target at all for space solar power, which is, in my view, and it just a, it, certainly for this administration, with their focus on climate change, it would be an unforgivable oversight. I, I agree 100%. I, with 
with um, with the documents that came out in the last administration. Uh, by the way, I've looked them up. They've been scrubbed from the website from uh, from the White House website, and and I know that that's policy. I'm not reading anything into that, uh, but. Uh, Liftport, our company, put a lot of effort into um, paragraph at a time, sometimes word and sentence at a time, deconstruction of that document. So if anybody's interested, uh, if they really want to dig into space policy uh, nuance and, uh, and details, uh, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it's super boring, but I think there's some important stuff in there. Um, John, what does the next 18 months look for look like for you? So um, I'd, I'd like to refer to history and, and, and stretch your question just slightly and make it 36 months uh, and highlight that if you, if, if you went back 36 months and you hypothesized that Today, there'd be um, uh, 30 tons of space hardware being produced at two kilogram, two two thousand dollars a kilogram, and six or seven hundred kilowatts of solar-powered RF satellite modules being launched every month, uh, to the tune of megawatts upon megawatts a year, and that's by one company for one market. Then you see how I see the next 36 months and what could happen either with the right kinds of investments on the entrepreneurial side or the wrong, the right kind of investments on the other side of the planet. Uh, Cause there's nothing in, in, the, in the approach that I, I, I prefer. It's, it's a really stupid approach. It's just Legos. It's three U cube sets and it's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. But I have, I've just noticed that that's exactly the way that SpaceX has done Starlink. And that's the way that Blue is gonna do OneWeb, or, or, or sorry, Kuiper. And that's the way, et cetera. So I think mass produce, that the, the world now knows low cost launch is feasible and here's at least one way to do it. Every, people will copy that. They also now know that really low cost megawatts of power in cis lunar space is possible. And here's one way to do that. And I don't think the, I think the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. I, I fully agree with that. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to put words in other people's mouths, but we had uh, Alexander on the call here is a commercial company. Earlier this morning, there was a, uh, a competitor that uh, in the business plan competition that is trying to build space-based solar power. From a commercial perspective, um, you know you, you are all trying to raise capital. You're you've all got different approaches. Um, you're all working on different MVPs, but at the end you're all trying to achieve the same goal. Let's, let's like raise the, the global standard of living of all human beings. I mean, that's a, I think that's a noble effort. Um, from the commercial perspective, uh, what do you need to succeed? And, and think about your other you know, fellow uh, commercial folks also. Uh, yeah, not a commercial, just across the board. So if I could, it, I thought of this yesterday during the remarks about launch vehicles. Uh, and uh, uh, I was shocked a couple of years ago uh, to go uh, to an event up in Silicon Valley with my daughter of six different uh, venture investment firms looking at, uh, at space and to discover that they all knew the same fact, which I had never heard at that time, which was that there were 150 distinct and different plays in low cost launch ongoing. 200, it's 200. No, no, at the time, this is three years ago. Yeah. And, and, and SpaceX is in the market with Starlink and is with, with Starship and it's gonna, it's got Falcon 9 reusable and you've got Blue with infinite pockets. And, and yet there are 200 plays for low cost launch. 
And the number one thing they said was, everybody on Sand Hill Road coming out of the back gate of Stanford has to have a play on launch or they're not in the, in the bleeding edge technology game. Nobody has a play on solar power satellites. And the reason is, as far as I can tell, it's because nobody has a play on solar power satellites. They all want to have a play on launch because everybody has a play on launch. Nobody has a play on SPS because nobody has a play on SPS. Nobody, they're all, they're all bleeding edge guys, but they're all risk averse. And so I personally believe that first 10 or, and this, this is in an era when 30, 40, 50 million at a, at a drop go into a new big data company because they have an algorithm. So I, I think if somebody wrote the check for $10, $20 million to a couple of, uh, of space solar power startups, all of a sudden, money would just flood into the sector. Suddenly, it would be a sector. It would be a sector. It would be the space, uh, space power, space energy sector uh, could blossom. I, 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 I agree, and I also agree that... Uh, <laughs> those those folks on Sand Hill Row are kind of chickens. Um, they're they're uh, lemmings. Lemmings comes to mind. Yeah, so yes, they all yes, follow. Oh, you gotta, go, oh, gotta go here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Colonel Felt, please. I, I do think that the venture capitalists are very uncreative, but and, and lemmings, but they don't want to be. I mean, everyone you talk to is like, so what's your your idea? Why should what should we do in addition to two hundred launch companies? And I'm like, well, what do you think those guys are going to launch? Let's talk about that. Right. Uh, and that's where I think there's a lot of opportunity to, um, to, to put ideas out there and money behind them. Uh, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see the Department of Energy say, we are going to buy uh, the energy being from space. We're going to pay a million dollars per watt as a starting yes. price point. And you guys, you entrepreneurs, so there's your market. You entrepreneurs, you go out there and you start beaming power down. And then the, the price over time, we will let it come down till it settles to market values, but we will incentivize the needed technology to kickstart this industry and, and get it going. If they did that, I think you'd have on, all kinds of entrepreneurs coming out of the woodwork because they'd be like, aha, a market, let's go get it. That's, that's what they can understand. So I think that's something the government could and should do to get things started is be the best possible customer of beamed power from space and let the, let the free market go solve that problem for us. I'd like you to go further with that and bring in uh, Pete. And I'm not sure, Veda, if you know that, that much about this, but um, Bruce Cahan, Dr. Cahan, talked last year about a, um, a marketplace, a, uh, if you will, a Chicago Board of Exchange style. The space Commodities Exchange, right. And, yeah. and launch is one thing that's on there, kilograms to Leo, and, and power beaming should also be a part of the Space Commodities Exchange. Right, right. Um, if there is a market and you're moving dollars for services, those services will become possible. They will, it will enable all of that tech. So um, uh, beam power, water, fuel, all of those things become much more doable if you have the financial tools in place. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I think it's exciting. I think we're in exciting, an exciting space. Uh, Pete, you know, you say something? Yeah, please. Yeah, you know, I mean, we are, we are hampered a bit in the way we have sort of constructed ourselves with a requirement system. But, you know, if you if you take an opportunity approach and you want to say, hey, I want to create an infrastructure that I can feed off of, let's let's consider like what could the Space Force do if it if it considered part of its role to, you know, give birth to a, a broader industrial logistical base. So, you know, for instance, let's say that the Space Force just said, I uh, in such and such a date, I want to buy in space you know, power beamed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of a megawatt, right? And maybe, you know, that you might find it difficult to justify that for any particular, you know, market or, or thing, but maybe you just said, look, I just want to know that that's available. May, in the meantime, maybe I'll build some in-space development and test facility. But if you knew that, that that was the case, let's think about what would be the downstream things. First of all, it's much easier to mature 
a space solar power uh, design thing at low energies and if you're not having to have very large apertures beaming down. So you could do a lot, uh, a lot of in-space development, right? That's still an awful lot of uh, photovoltaics that have to be built in space qualified that stimulates that. That's a lot of launch. And as you build to higher and higher, like, I mean, think about even how many Starship launches uh, John's uh, two gigawatt thing is, right? I mean, that's, that's a large number of Starship launches, uh, which is its own, you know, giant market for, for one solar power satellite. But on its way, you're stimulating launch, which means that you're launching regularly. You know, now you've got beam power, which is a very flexible resource. You've matured a manufacturing base for in-space, uh, you know, construction and, and servicing. And if you did it right, as I said, you know, once you have a presidential finding that space solar power power beaming uh, needs to be, uh, you know, have a presidential finding under the Defense Production Act, that means that the DOD could actually directly subsidize not the technology development, but the actual, you know, production end of that in space. So at the end of that, right, you would have, you know, the ability to purchase, whether you did it through an exchange or directly, you know, you would, you would be able to purchase on demand when and if it arrives a megawatt and everything that you could potentially do with a megawatt for in-space manufacturing, servicing, experiments, but you've also made available much lower cost photovoltaics to the entire space industry, probably, you know, uh, you know, as the space industrial base 2020 said, that by itself is a critical, you know, industry that we could lose and needs to be automated to be competitive. You further stimulated launch and you reap all the benefits on the global stage of being perceived to be a leader toward this technology that could scale to real urgent global problems. So, so maybe that's one of the things we look for as uh, we're writing policy documents in the near future. Um, you know, there have been power purchase agreements in this industry. They uh, were pretty far-fetched and I think fairly unrealistic, but they existed as financial tools. Uh, would that be the kinds of things that could um, catalyze this industry? Uh, is that, I mean, we've got technology in development, right? We've got different, different architectures, but we've got some technology demonstrations. What's missing currently is how do you pay for it? And, uh, you know, some of these systems might be the kinds of policy decisions that could help uh, catalyze that. Yes, well, I'm seeing people uh, nod. Yes. Yeah, I, I would just say, and I'll let yeah. others answer, but a absolutely, right? Because, you know, anybody who would want to be a startup in space solar power, right? In, in order for them to liberate that investment, they have to show that there is at least one customer that has stable revenue, right? And this is, this failure is zero cost to the government if it's under Defense Production Act Title III, because you only pay for it if it arrives. But the minute that somebody like John or any of his competitors, you know, can, can go to them with a letter that, that says, look, the government has said that they're willing to purchase this on orbit in this state, right? That's money that they can turn into investment. Go for it, John. I, I um, can I, may I say? Yeah, please, Alex. I, I think we're in three phases. And I think the importance to actually go backwards from 2040 and 50, where we have settlement and exploitation, where we do need energy actually in space in existence so not only for earth but also for the transits and for mars and other settlement places so when you go back then and you look at where we are today we're in the exploration and science phase so we have to use the next 10 years extensively to do the exploration and the science to actually be ready to launch in 2030 and if I put it in perspective, we did, we come from Cambridge and there's my colleague is also on here, Will Honey. We did a calculation and actually tried to come back from the baseload power, which by the way, until 2050 is doubling on earth. And in that perspective, you need to get to one gigabit, gigawatt of launch per day into space. So if you come back from that perspective, that's 360 gigawatt launched over a year's period and you would do this for 10 years, going, you would get to 60% of the world's energy 
baseload power. Then you could do the remaining 40% with renewables on Earth, wind and solar. Um, but from that perspective, we have to calculate backwards. Where do we have to, and what do we have to do today to get to that kind of capability in 2030? So, because you know, like a lot of energy systems we forget have taken 90 years to develop, to get the gas turbine to one giga, gigawatt kind of gas turbine. It took us 90 years until Siemens, General Electric and others actually had it so safe. Mm -hmm. This will be very similar. So we need to look at this as something like, okay, when do we actually finally get to start and do and send demonstration objects to be ready? Because we do have to be ready. Otherwise, all of this timeline is actually moving out, you know, artificial habitats in 2040 and 50. So, and, and we do need that power for us because I, I see it with all the electricity we need for our systems. You know, ev everything is electrifying. Um, um, and so that's my input I want to give you. Um, and I think with that ambition, going backwards where we are today, we have to come to politics and say, look, if you give us a paper, it costs you right now nothing. It's just a promise of taking our energy and then let us work on it, similar to Falcon One, you know? Th th thank you, Alex. Um, you know, this, is, this world is changing pretty fast. Uh, when I first, you know, yesterday I kind of showed out and showcased, uh, you know, this is, this is the first book I ever read on space-based solar power uh, by a guy named John Man, uh, John, um, I'm looking at John, sorry, uh, Ralph, Ralph Manson. Uh, and, and it really, it, I mean, I'm not going to uh, pull any punches. It changed my life, right? That, that those kinds of things allow us to imagine what is possible. So the problem that we have is we have to get from where we are to where we want to go. So here in Seattle, um, it is becoming the mass produced satellite capital of the world, right? There were um, slightly more than 800 satellites have been launched so far this year. I mean, just let that sink in for a second, 800 satellites in a year, when I first started, there were only about 400 assets at all in space, right? And we're going to a world where we're gonna have between uh, the Satellite Industry Association uh, predicts uh, 90 to 110,000 satellites uh, in the next 10 years. So most of them are going to be built in Seattle. Um, uh, you know, that's where Starlink is in Redmond. Um, uh, probably that's where the Kuiper system from Amazon is going to be constructed. And we're really good at starting to build modular space assets, right? So that points pretty nicely to kind of the path that John is on because we're proving that that technology is possible. The mass producible space asset was straight up science fiction in the beginning. Uh, so now if you marry the technology that Colonel Felt's team is working on of uh, technology demonstrations and Mankins is working on as, a, as an architecture, um, I'm gonna guess by the video that Alex has been running in the background for a day and a half, he needs a lot of modular systems also, right? So now we, we've got this industrial foundation. Uh, it might be nascent, but it, it, does, it does exist. Jim, did you factor any of that stuff in when you were working on your report? The, the mass producible uh, qualities, the, the nascent technology that's in development, you know, where did you come at this report? From what, from what perspective did you start it? And where are you now? Well, some of the other authors on the report were looking at the, uh, the, uh, the situation of mass production and uh, how it might affect uh, mainly, uh, we, we have some specialists in, in the space traffic management and orbital debris areas. Uh, and, and that was their, their, their biggest concern is to try and model what's, uh, what's going to be happening. Uh, but uh, we we also have had some some of our people go and tour the plants where this this type of stuff is happening, uh, 
And um, of course, they're sworn to secrecy about all of the trade secrets that they saw. But um, uh, but uh, yeah, they're they're very much on board with uh, with this being the future. And um, uh, and I mean, w with that, I just uh, from my own perspective would like to uh, give you kind of the rule of thumb that I have used as a longtime student of technology history, and that is that that the the really serious development gets going approximately a decade after the point where you overcome the giggle factor. So you could, you could see that for things like uh, the um, uh, interstate highway system or for uh, human spaceflight, including getting people to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that uh, for space tourism. Okay, now we're going to be seeing that for solar power satellites, because I, I think I think we've overcome the giggle factor, but just recently. So I, I, I really I, I really think that that is is going to play into the timeline in a similar way that, it, that it's done in the past. Um, but it, the the developments, if the if the if the need is there and the uh, the economics work right, can can happen relatively fast, and. Uh, you know the examples I like to use is that if you if you go from the point of of Robert Goddard in the 1920s with his his little experimental liquid fueled rocket, 40 years later you had the Saturn V. Okay, that's like about half a human lifetime later you had the Saturn V. Um, uh, Today is the 60th anniversary of Alan Shepard's Mercury flight, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a special day for me. That was kind of my awakening time when I first became a space geek. So um, 20 years after that Mercury flight, you had the space shuttle, a, a manned system to carry multiple people and a cargo bay that has the equivalent volume of 17 mercury capsules. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, that in 20 years that happened. Um, so, uh, so, so looking at uh, at at how these these kind of things have evolved, um, yeah, some of these things are helped along by uh, picking ho low hanging fruit, but there are some really hard things that have developed in in uh, in, in very uh, uh, rapid pace uh, as well. So um, uh, I, I really expect that we're, we're going to see an acceleration in this in, in the years to come, just like we have, you know, not, not exactly comparable to the way we have in consumer electronics, for example, uh, but, uh, uh, but it will be very remarkable. Uh, so uh, so I, would, I would expect that um, all of these things that we've all been talking about coming into play in, in the manufacturing, the modularity, in the, the reduced uh, cost of launch. And at the same time, continuing increase in the demand for electricity around the world, uh, which uh, I've seen estimates that say that between now and 2040 worldwide, there's gonna be need to be trillions of dollars of investment in, in new production and distribution. Uh, so, hey, some of those trillions could uh, come to uh, uh, innovative things like, like, uh, like solar power satellites which I'm convinced will deliver faster than uh, fusion power, as, as John indicated uh, earlier. Uh, you know, I mean, fusion power, if you just look at the past 50 years um, and compare it to solar power satellites, fusion power has gotten funding of, of what? About three orders of magnitude greater. Um, is it, oh, John, John's what, what, five orders of magnitude? Is that what you're saying, John? Okay, all right. So I even underestimated that. Now imagine if-, if Billions it, and billions of dollars. You know, billions and billions, billions yes. And billions. Uh, uh, if, if you can imagine that for all of that history, the, um, uh, the, the equivalent funding had been spent on solar power satellites as has been spent on fusion, <laughs> Gee, which one do you think would come to market first? <laughs> I, I think I'd put my bet on the solar power satellites. Uh, so, so that that's that's my my view. Like you, um, Michael, you know, I, I I live much of my life in the future. Me, me, me too. Uh, you know that that comment you just made a moment ago about the uh, the Google factor is 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 winding down, but just barely. 
uh, you know, being a space elevator guy for 20 years of my career, I've lived my whole life in that giggle factor. And uh, frankly, I'm a little envious that your giggle factor is, is ending because I don't think that mine is. Uh, gentlemen, we need to wrap up. I want to give each of you just a super quick, uh, you know, final comments. Colonel Felt, you had your hand up. Please uh, feel free to jump in. Well, let me just say that having these conversations is a wonderful step in the right direction. I haven't heard much giggling at all on this meeting, and I do think we're reaching the end of the giggle factor. This technology can work. And I think there's some flaws in thinking we have to be careful of going forward. Don't think that we have to ever get this technology down to, you know, lower per kilowatt hour than natural gas or something like that, because uh, there are things that this can do that the old infrastructure can't do. And in talking to DOD users, that's been one of the real eye-opening things for me is that, you know, to get power on demand anywhere you want it immediately is really valuable and it allows you to do things you just can't even envision today. I mean, refueling, we today, when we refuel a fighter plane from, a, from an airplane, that costs over $100 per pound of fuel that gets delivered in terms of the, the whole cost. So if you can meet, match, think of that as your near-term market, that if you can match that cost price point, you, you've got a really valuable technology, even if it doesn't ever replace everything. So don't let us fall into the trap of, oh, the efficiency is so low. Oh, we'll never get the cost down below natural gas. Who cares? There's a lot of near-term, very valuable markets and things that we haven't even discovered yet that I think this will enable. So I'm really excited about the future. And I'm really excited that we could have these conversations and, and work on this technology. And uh, I think we're going to make a lot of progress over the next decade on this. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Oh. Super excited. Uh, John, you want the last comments fast, please? You bet. Uh, only other comment I would make is that in addition to uh, a major competitor that's come up a couple of times during the last couple of day days, I would just highlight that we also have friends and allies who are quite interested in both carbon, net zero, and space solar power as a prospective solution. And uh, we need to be thinking uh, more vigorously about how the US should be reaching out to those friends or prospective friends before uh, somebody else makes them part of their program. I, uh, as an aside, I tried to reach the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to have uh, a spokesperson come in and talk about a zero carbon energy miracle, which is Gates's official quote on the topic. Uh, they politely declined, but they did point me to some other resources. So we'll see if we can get some other allies to the table here. Uh, Peter, please, last comments. Absolutely. So, you know, first of all, I just think it's very important, you know, that the, that the, that the audience, particularly of cognizant voters and influencers, realize that here is a real solution to the scalable problem of climate change, green energy, uh, and energy period, uh, and that it enables a far more, thousands of times more ambitious space program. I think you have to consider the drop-down benefits of what you would learn on the journey for in-orbit uh, manufacturing, on-orbit servicing and maintenance, just power beaming in and of itself and the flexibility it opens up and we have to keep in mind that if we want to win the future, we have to take this seriously because we are competing with a civilization that when they were far younger than they are today, they built the Great Canal, the Great Wall, giant treasure ships, and, and recently the Three Gorges Dam, and now $100 billion in infrastructure uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative or One Belt, One Road, right? So they take infrastructure and infrastructure investments Barry. at scale extremely seriously. And if we want another American century, this is the big bet to make and we need to be making it this year. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, Dr. Veda, last comments, please. Oh, I think I'm all done. And um, I probably have some people in my next meeting that are mad that I haven't shown up yet. So I, I'm, <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm it for me. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate all of your time and expertise. This has been terrific. We're gonna turn it over to Lee. Uh, thanks a lot, y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you. That, that was really terrific. Um, 
appreciate how Colonel Felt just brings in that extra impetus because people always talk about economics and policy, economics and policy, but there is this other piece out there and it's competition and it's uh, positioning yourself with a major disruptor to the energy, global energy, energy picture. So um, I think that that's sort of the linchpin of our, of our discussion over the past two days, really.